Okay, Dominique, on your cue, we can go ahead and get started. Go ahead, VK, thank you. You're welcome. I'll make sure we're recording. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CBMSDC Business Retooling and Relaunch webinar. I'm your host and moderator, BK Fields. We have an informative session planned for you today titled Get Ready to Reopen. We hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and safe, and we thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, just a few housekeeping tips for everyone. All of our audience participant lines are automatically muted. However, throughout the broadcast this morning, you are welcome to submit a question using the chat box feature that is in the GoToWebinar dashboard on your screen. Also, today's session is being recorded and it will be available for you to review later and to share with your colleagues. So now at this time, I am pleased to introduce our CVMSDC president and CEO, Dominique Milton, who will share some key information for you about the council and introduce our guest presenters um, for today's session. Good morning, Dominique. Good morning, Valerie, and thank you so much for helping to moderate this session this morning, this very important session. I am so excited to have with us Thomas Stith and Ronald Harvey today to share some insight with you on how we build through COVID-19. But to get started, I never like to have a presentation without sharing with our audience what our mission is as an organization. So Valerie, if you could um, forward that first slide, please. At CBMSDC, we are a nonprofit organization, and our mission as an advocacy group is to expand business opportunities for minority business enterprises and create mutually beneficial links between corporate partners and MBEs. The ultimate outcome is to add economic value to the supply chain while increasing economic opportunities in the business community. And the way in which we do that is by working four pillars. The four pillars, next slide, please, Valerie. The four pillars of our work include certification. We are the largest certifying agency in the United States. We certify ethnic minorities to say that you are who you say you are and you're ready to do business with our corporate partners. So we also develop. Um, I like to say that we hang our help hat on the developmental piece. We develop our MBEs by providing to them um, training opportunities. We have year-long training opportunities. Um, with Sunoco, um, we have a week-long training program with the University of Richmond, with Tuck. So, you know, as a car needs a tune-up, so, do, so does your business. And what we do is we help you develop your business so that you're ready to evolve to the next level and be ready to do business with our um, corporate partners. Next, we connect you. We have at least four connecting events per year. Um, we often have more that are at, at the um, vendor sites at our corporate partner sites where we help connect you with those businesses that you want to do business with, putting them all together in the same room. It makes your life much easier. It makes the process quicker. And by providing those opportunities, you gain extra value by being a member of CVMSDC. And then next, we advocate for you. You know, with the sheer size of our organization with over 12,000 members, we can advocate for you on a national, regional, and local level. So if you're an MBE and you're trying to get in, let's just say with BMW or Boeing, and you're having difficulty making that connection, we're there for you to help with that connection. So that is the work that we do. Our customers are major corporations like Bank of America, m and Bank, BMW, Clemson, Boeing. We have partnerships with local agencies like the SBA, who will be speaking today. And we also have our minority business enterprises like Ron Harvey, who is a coach and consultant who will be speaking later today. So without further ado, I want to introduce our guest for you today. Next slide, please, Valerie. Today, we have two business consultants that will share their perspectives on how to build your business through COVID-19. There's been a lot of talk on you know, how we survive right now, but today we wanna to focus a little bit more on how we get through this and then build through so that we're stronger on the back end. I'm really excited to have Thomas Stith with us um, he oversees an office that drives economic development by assisting local entrepreneurs to start and grow businesses. He also directs implementation of SBA programs related to assessing capital, business advising, and government contracts. 
Thomas comes to us with a wealth of consulting experience because he started the Michael Thomas group before he joined SBA. He co-founded this group and uh, he worked with businesses to look at um, how you build uh, in the public and private sector. He also worked with clients to improve their understanding of an ability to perform marketing, government relations, strategic planning, and internal assessment functions. Before that, he was with Rivermont Capital, where he was a senior advisor in the areas of investment, development, opportunities, and investor relations. He was chief of staff to Governor Pat McCrory from 2013 to 2017, and as a city of Durham councilman from 1999 to 2007. Thomas Stith resides in Durham, North Carolina, and he's a graduate of North Carolina Central University, holding a master's and bachelor's degree um, in business administration. Welcome, Thomas. Next up, we have Ronald Harvey. Ronald Harvey is a coach. Uh, he has an MBA, and he's a certified leadership coach. He's a John Maxwell team certified coach, and he is vice president of Global Core Strategies and Consultant. Harvey is a retired U.S. Army veteran with more than 34 years of leadership experience. He believes his purpose is to make a difference by inspiring leaders to excel through lean, learning, growth, and adding value to others. Ron serves as the chairman for the Columbia Chamber of Small Business Council and serves on the boards of Midlands Communities and Schools and the Carolina Virginia Minority Supply Development Council, where he is a new board member on our team. As a leadership coach, he has been described as motivating and engaging. Ron has collaborated with small business leaders and government leaders at all levels to ensure that collaboration was conducted at the most effective levels for everyone. He has an, a specific passion and focus to add value and make a difference because, as he always says, people always matter. And I will just share with you that each Monday morning at 7.30 in the morning, Ron leads a group of leaders and he really starts our week off and charges us with how are we going to lead through this yeah, situation that we're in right now, which is why I was prompted to have him join us to share some of his leadership um, perspective and insight, okay? So with that, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I'm gonna start off with um, what our goals are for today. I want us to look at, look at funding options and strategies for building through. By the end of this call, you should have a better insight on financial bill plans and strategic bill plans. How will you plan to build through to be stronger in the end? That is our focus today. So I'm gonna start out with Thomas. Thomas, last week I had some highs and some lows. You know, I was going, everything was going fine. And when we got that letter that all the funds dried up with the SBA, I mean, I was just frozen because I knew that most of my MBEs had not received the funding that they needed. Um, we as an organization, as a nonprofit, we didn't get our funding. Uh, across the country, most of my peers did not get their funding. So start off by telling us what happened so we can clear the clear the air there. And then we can talk about what we can do <laughs> to get funding. So tell us what happened. Uh, well, first and foremost, Dominic, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to join today and appreciate your leadership in CVMSDC's vision to bring this type of discussion at a much needed time. We and we're facing a global pandemic and it is time for us all to collaborate uh, to move forward. And uh, I'm, I'm going to just encourage you to hang in there, even though the, I won't say the check is in the mail. Uh, we'll, we'll, let's, let's talk today about how you may be able to, to, to uh, achieve now that we may have a round two. Um, what, I, what may be helpful is just give a real quick thumbnail of how we got to where we are now and talk about what has been available and what we see available in particular with SBA uh, recovery uh, initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, okay, thanks. Uh, while well, I'm obviously here in North Carolina, North Carolina was declared a disaster on March the 18th, but either before, it was soon after that, the entire country it was first time in our history that a virus was designated as a uh, eligible cause for disaster. That triggered one funding stream that we'll talk about today, and then the, the as significant paycheck protection program. But the economic injury disaster loan program was triggered by uh, US Administrator Jovita Carranza declaring uh, a disaster uh, for our country based on the COVID-19 virus. That loan uh, was, and, and still is, if you were in process, and maybe it's an important distinction, 
if you are in process for the economic injury disaster loan, they are still being reviewed. They were uh, loans that could go up to $2 million, 30 year term, 3.75% interest for small businesses, nonprofits and faith-based organizations were eligible. Their rate would be 2.75% any new additional applications was, was indeed halted on last Thursday when the funding uh, for the Paycheck Protection Program was extinguished just because of the demand and limited funding for the EIDL. So those, those are still being processed. I literally uh, received a call this morning that someone <laughs> received, uh, and I can give you some national numbers, that, that, that you know, those funds were being expended on a national level, almost 27,000 businesses received $5.5 billion on the EIDL. Uh, in North Carolina alone, uh, about $148 million to a little over 760 businesses. A part of that was the Economic Injury Advance. That was the advance that is actually a grant. You may receive up to $10,000, and it's based on number of employees. So typically $1,000 per employee, up to $10,000 in North Carolina. That uh, already $88 million has been distributed, well, funded for a little over 19,000 businesses. Nationally, you're talking about 3.2 billion to over 775,000 small businesses. So the economic injury disaster loan was the initial response that is recognizing that we literally have a disaster in this country. On March the 27th, the Paycheck Protection Program was launched one week after uh, Congress passed the legislation. And I say that to say that within a week, a $349 billion initiative was stood up. Uh, when it was paused last week because of funding being extinguished, there were 1.6 million loans had been approved. Here in North Carolina, almost 40,000 loans, $8 billion. Nationally, as I said, $349 billion was ex exhausted. That loan was designed to provide a vehicle for businesses to maintain their employees uh, because it includes a forgivable clause. The loans can be up to $10 million, two-year period, 1% interest. But the key component is if once receiving the funds, that eight-week period after that, if you spend up to 80, uh, excuse me, 75% during that eight-week period on payroll, the other, you can spend up to 100%, but at least 75% on payroll, 25% on utilities and uh, rent mortgage payments, that combined expenditure will reduce the amount of your loan. So that will be forgiven. So the potential is, depending on the size of the loan, if it is all expended on payroll and you expend the amount of loan, the full loan could be forgiven or whatever the percentage loan amount based on what you spend on allowable expenses during that eight week period. Right. What we're waiting for now literally uh, has passed the U.S. Senate, uh, is in the U.S. House now, is another round of funding for both the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. For Paycheck Protection Program, the Senate has, U.S. Senate has passed appropriations for $310 billion. As a component of that funding, $60 billion at this point has been designated to uh, go to lenders that typically work with smaller businesses because that was one thing that came out of the first round candidly is significant response so not enough funding for all businesses smaller businesses in particular felt they didn't have opportunity or access to lending institutions so 60 billion dollars at least as part of the uh, senate legislation has been earmarked for C cdfis smaller credit unions, smaller lenders. Um, yes. And so now that, is, that is waiting to be uh, voted on, on the U.S. House. On the economic injury disaster side, an additional $60 billion, $10 billion for the advanced loan component, and then, or grant rather, it's not a loan, I mean a loan, it is a grant, and then an additional $50 billion for the economic injury disaster loan. So that's where we stand today. I we definitely want to go into more detail because I'm sure there are questions. But, but overall, those are the two major initiatives. As you see on the slide as well, for our small businesses that have existing SBA loans, the 7A, 504, uh, Community Advantage are very popular. SBA is deferring, we're actually paying those payments for six months. 
So if you're an existing SBA uh, loan holder, uh, you may want to investigate uh, having a deferment uh, for six months of payment of uh, interest, uh, principal and interest. Uh, so I'll okay. stop now. Uh, and the final slide, I believe, is just uh, information. Uh, just contact on me, and we can provide also direct contact to, to follow up on your loan. Where's my loan? What's the status? And I can provide that for you to, to post as well. Okay, sounds good. Valerie, if you can go back to the previous slide. Thank you so much, Thomas. So what I want to focus sure. on there on that previous slide, because you know we were grateful for the large amount of funding that was approved originally. Um, but as I said earlier, most of us did not get in. Okay, there was a large percentage that you, you mentioned did get through, but most of us didn't get through. So any strategies um, on when the second round opens up, what do our businesses need to be doing? I've been, I've been on calls where they say, have your files loaded in PDF format, have them on your computer ready to upload. But what I find is most important is to have that relationship ready with the banker that is going to take you. And it's not necessarily the big banks. I heard you say that some of the smaller banks are going to have some set aside you know you can't depend on your larger banks to have this process through it's all about that relationship so give us some pointers there thomas on how to get ready to take advantage of this new wave of money like i, I understand it might be up to upwards of 400 billion dollars additional that's coming out i know some of it's going towards research you know some of it's going to supplies um but for the portion that's going to go to our small businesses who are the most in need how can they position themselves to be ready? I would say start right now. Don't wait for the legislation to get passed. And you're exactly right and on target. First and foremost, talk to your, if you have an existing banking relationship, talk with them and see what, what their status is going to be. I've talked to lenders that literally have thousands of applications that they have had to pause from the last round. So I would really get, have a candid conversation with my banker. Uh, if you have that lending relationship to determine their strategy at this point it unless there is direction and guidance and that is a potential as well uh, many banks are just picking up based on the applications they have received so get a sense of whether your existing banking relationship is going to be available if not then as you mentioned I you, you're not tied to your own bank you can look at other banks within the market our uh, district office website has a listing of all SBA uh, lenders, so there are other options. And as you mentioned, community banks and your credit unions that are uh, participating in the program are options as well. But use this time, uh, and, 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 and as you mentioned, um, the, the initial funding within 14 days or less, SBA did 14 years worth of lending. Uh, they approved, uh, as I said, uh, over $340 billion. So it, it's, it, it, it is a significant demand, and I would have various lending options available uh, as we move to what we feel is going to be the next round of funding. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me recap a couple of things that you said. So if you go to sba.gov, you can actually find a listing of local lenders if you put your zip code in. Um, that are available to support you, right? I, I would do that. And if you're in North Carolina, even more specific, sba.gov forward slash NC, sba.gov forward slash NC, and that'll have the, and I know we're talking Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, right. but our, our site will have uh, North Carolina lenders, or you can go to the national site as well. Okay, great. Now, for those small businesses that need help, you know, we we have an accountant. We, we were able to put our paperwork together, but some smaller businesses needed help. Is your organization available to help them gather information, provide cons consulting to them to get ready? We, not only SBA and in, in, in the district office is available as well. We have numerous uh, resource partners, and they exist in every state, maybe different names, but within North Carolina, the Small Business and Technology Development Centers are located although virtually now at all our universities. They are very well versed. They're taking over a thousand calls and clients a week to help them understand the various loan processes, prepare their paperwork. We have a Women Business Center in Charlotte, Asheville, Durham, Raleigh, and Fayetteville. They have a specific lens for women-owned businesses but are open to all. Uh, and our Veterans Business Center in Fayetteville. 
Uh, and so while these, you know, not only North Carolina specific, SBA has resource partners in all states. They're going to be your small business centers, your women business centers that can help you prepare because in many cases, this is the first time a small business right. has applied for a loan period and, and most specifically an SBA uh, type loan if it's economic uh, EIDL or through their lender, which would be the Paycheck Protection Program. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So let's take a little shift and let's talk about building through. So the PPP and all these emergency funds are set up to help us survive right now. But once we survive, right, we've got to get through this. And so I know before all of this started, there were loans available from SBA. There are other types of loans available. Talk to us a bit about strategies that businesses should have in terms of having a reserve, having working capital, utilizing loans to be able to be stronger to get through this, aside yeah. from this emergency money. No, uh, uh, many business found in this this crisis highlighted the need for just financial planning, uh, the controls within the business, having a business plan. Our same resource partners and SBA can help the small businesses as we look forward. And that's a very good point, Dominique, and something I've already started thinking about, even though we're trying to work through these programs. Yes. What's next? What's on the next side? What can we do? And it's, you know, there is going to be a new norm. It is not going to be the same operating environment as we had a couple of months ago. So what can SBA do from a support perspective with the resources, uh, technical resources, uh, also, um, uh, you know, federal contracting. Our role even before this was to assist uh, uh, small businesses access federal contracting. If you're in North Carolina, uh, no, over $2, uh, $2 billion worth of federal contracts were uh, provided to small businesses in the state. That's a market that maybe some small businesses haven't looked at before. And additionally, uh, helping with access to capital. So now engaging SBA and our resource partners to start planning for the new norm, which is going to be very new uh, as we move forward. Okay, great. I'm going to come back to you because I want to I hear some specific um, options that might be available. But I want to segue to Ron right now. Ron, on your weekly calls, um, and thank you for being here, Ron. Just greatly appreciate you. On your weekly calls, um, your, your insight has been invaluable. And this week we talked about crisis as a time to be very creative and plan. We can't, um, our listeners can't be sitting around waiting. We can't wait for these loans to be approved. We can't wait for this to be over. We need to be in emergency planning mode. Talk to us about that as a coach and a consultant, Ron. Yeah, and, and Dominique, uh, thank you for, for hosting this and for the organization um, taking a role, an active role, and being able to start talking about the things that are, are people are talking about in isolation or if you will stay at home you know and they're just talking about it amongst themselves so thank you for having me um in our organization to to be able to share what our insight and our experience has been and so you know as you're sitting you know at the house i mean things are, are happening um, that you have no control of and that's what the policy and, and when it's going to get approved and what what's going to be available but there are things that as a business owner that we do have control of and I think it's super important, the analogy I, I often use is what are you building for the customer that you want to serve? And, and that's shifting drastically. And so the customers that you want to serve or desire to serve, what is it while we're in the holding pattern that you're building so you can effectively serve them? And, and that may be totally different that you don't waste your time while you're in a crisis sitting around concerned about the stuff that, that you, you don't have control of. And so for us as an organization, how do you pivot? How do you begin to understand that a service that may have been phenomenally well prior to COVID-19 may not be a necessary service once this is over? You know, as Thomas said, that it will be different. Um, and so I think all of us have to take a look at how does our organization need to be different? And it starts with, with you. Who do you want to be once COVID-19 is over? But more right. importantly, who do your clients or your partners need you to be to better serve them? Which is a more important question as far as our organization, you know, uh, doing things virtual, that's gonna be a, a next normal stepping forward because organizations are gonna realize that every meeting doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. Every conference doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. All of the things that we normally would jump in a car and drive to, to get to is gonna shift. And some people um, are, are not really still, even with this happening, Dominique, are not embracing technology. That's right. 
and, and it's amazing that people are not embracing it, but we're forced into this space. If you're going to be a, in, in our position as an entrepreneur, business owner, MBE, that you got to figure out a way to stay visible. And, and I think that's not just visible as far as, you know, being able to put something up, something of value, something that's very professionally well done and, and ask for help if you don't know how to do it. But there's not going to be a, a way for you to stay relevant if you can't stay visible. It's yeah. Yeah, so that's critical. That, that, that point right there is very critical, Ron. So there's a difference between pivoting and retooling, right? To yeah. stay relevant. Yeah. Talk to share yeah. with us the difference. Yeah, and, and, and I think you started with it. When you started this presentation, you started with the mission and the values of the organization. And I think every organization has to have a mission and some values. If, if you will, think of like basketball. You know, when, when a player has his foot planted, that foot stays planted, but they can they can actually pivot in a different direction. And so you got to stay solid to what you what you do and, and, you know, as far as your mission and your vision, because as a leader, if you don't have a vision that people don't know where they're going and why they're doing it, it's very confusing. And there's a lot of ambiguity and it's hard to stay successful in that space. So don't throw your mission out the window and don't throw your vision out of the window. Stay solid on those things. But what inside of that is super important for you to pivot in the direction that your client and your customer and society is saying that we need to go into? And so what are you building as you look at the photo on the on the slide deck? What are you building while you're on the runway? Because the restrictions will get lifted. And the important thing is, while you're waiting, what are you doing to stay in business, first of all? Ask for help. Use all of the assistance that you can get. Start collaborating more. If you weren't collaborating prior to now, it's going to be really, really difficult not to collaborate later. And so start in all those conversations. Oftentimes in MBs, we will look at someone, Dominique, that does the same thing I, I do and look at them as a competitor. That, that's not reality anymore. If you don't figure out how to be a collaborator with those people that do something similar or exactly like you do it and start learning how to partner with them, I think you put yourself in a position of not being able to stay relevant. Yeah. And, and I think MBE struggle with that. Um, but what I, I think where I learned the lesson when I watch US Airways and American Airlines partner, two major airlines partner to bring something together so they can both stay in business, if two major airlines can bring two people with that level of CEO and executive level and all that staff together to stay in business, why can't MBEs do it? And so I think it's going to be really important for us to say, how do we bring all of our resources, our talent, and our capabilities together to better serve some of the people, especially if you go into government federal contracting? Right. It's right. going to be important that you begin to say, what do I do on the runway so that when restrictions are lifted, that I actually can get back in the air? And time is going to be urgent. Because when they open, when they release all restrictions, like now, we're not sure if the government is going to open tomorrow or one month from now. Regardless of the scenario, they're not going to wait for you. When they say right. we're back in business, they're going to expect for us to deliver right then. And so I think it's important for us to be prepared for whatever that window is. We got to have the capacity and capability and the resources to respond quick. They will not wait for as an MBE or a small business. No major corporation is going to hit the pause button. That, that is so true. And just, you know, we have um, we have some retooling uh, strategies available to help our MBEs. I have a call every Friday. You can sign up yeah. to have a retooling session with me so I can hear what your business is going through and give you some insight on how to retool. Um, Tim Pecorora is offering a six week retooling program through yes. our council. Um, and so these are, are, are critical. Let me just share an example because I just love examples. So Jeff Foster, he has a plastics molding company in North Carolina. He just sent me an article this morning that was published in Forbes. There's not a BMW that rolls off the line in South Carolina without, without one of his plastic parts in it, right? So that's he was focused on what he was making up into this. But we, we've been talking about pivoting and retooling. He quickly retooled his line so he can make plastic face shields. And then we quickly connected him with new customers that he's never dealt with before, new customers to be able to deliver this real-time product to address the COVID-19 crisis. And so that that was ingenious, right? So we have yes. a, an individual who embroiders for BMW. And quickly, I reached out to her. Duke Energy wanted somebody who could make masks. She retooled to make masks. We have a company that makes soda. They retooled to make hand sanitizer, and they were shipping gallons of hand sanitizer. So, you know, you said this uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ron, you, you know, in a crisis, the, a true leader 
you know, th they show up, right? And so you're yeah. either going to show up as a failure very quickly, or you're going to show up as a success. And, and yeah. how you get through crisis and how you manage a time like this really shows your character. So let's, let's, let's switch back to you, Thomas, just for a second. Talk to us about how we can retool financially. Well, I think, uh, first of all, taking an assessment of where, where you are now as a small business, as, as we're saying in this discussion, there is no sector that has not been impacted. So we know the small business community in particular has had a devastating effect. So to take an assessment of where you are, uh, as you even in the short run, as you pursue uh, these loans, there will be some assessment on, on the business viability. You know, will the business be able to sustain moving forward? So now you have an opportunity to do a self-evaluation, but more importantly, not only as you go after available grants or loans now, but starting projecting out what will my, and you know, you're right, uh, I'm familiar with Jeff Foster and he's an innovator. You know, what, what do I have to do to, you know, to thrive and survive in the marketplace and financially, what is that going to call for? Uh, do I have the uh, financial wherewithal if I'm getting, you know, 10 new customers, if you're making face shields and, and that is going to increase my output by X percent? Do I have the capital to support that or the lines of credit or where have you to support that? So, again, as Ronald is saying, now is not only time to plan for what your business is going to look like, but how are you going to financially sustain that? Or, you know, a typical SBA loan, which is a 7A loan, which is utilized for general operating expenses. Is that something I need so I can scale now to meet this new demand? So those are the type of things uh, that we really are encouraging and working with small businesses to start thinking through, to think through now. Yeah, so that's critical. The general operating expense, I just want to focus on that for a little bit because I have MBEs that fall in two camps. You know, one says, okay, I can't find the, the access to capital that I need. Uh, another group says, I, I'm just going to spend my money and I'm going to, you know, work this through because I don't want any loans. And and I said, oh, don't spend all your own money. There's money out there that you need to have in the bank for reserve so that you, when you come to a crisis period, you're not just struggling, all right? Or when you run out of working capital, you're not looking around and trying to find money because the worst time to look for money is when you don't have any money. You need to exactly. look for money when you have money in the bank and your credit is good, right? Don't wait and mess it all up. <laughs> right. No, you're exactly right. And it, as we are finding out now, it is difficult to operate in a crisis mode. Uh, so I would definitely uh, look at strategies that don't deplete their own, um, uh, you know, foundational funding or their emergency fund. Now is the time to be to utilize uh, other funding sources. And, and as we found with this first round with the Paycheck Protection Program, some small businesses didn't have a banking relationship. Uh, so you, you've got to start uh, developing those basic constructs within your, your firm as you move forward. And now clearly, uh, as we're saying, now's the opportunity to do that. Yeah, I know one thing that we're gonna do different as organizations, like we have three banking relationships with very large banks and they're great relationships, um, but now I'm gonna add another relationship with a smaller bank. So that's, that's step one for us. We're gonna have a very small local bank that you know, they're in my cell phone and I can text them on a Saturday or a Sunday and we can have a conversation about what needs to happen. So that's the first thing that we're gonna do. We have all of our paperwork in order. It's uh, uploadable at any moment when somebody says go. As a matter of fact, when I get off this call, I'm going to be talking to a local banker to help us out. Um, we are working on some reserve. And I, if, if you have a list of different, I know we have the 7A loan. Um, there's some other loans, again, that were available before this whole disaster started. I'd like for our listeners to be able to have access to um, some suggestions that you have, Thomas, on other loan options that are out there. So um, that that's the second, that's the third thing. And then Fourth, we need to have that strategic plan on paper, right? So what are you going to do? Ron, help us with this. You know, how can we retool strategically? Give us maybe your top three points on what businesses need to be doing to retool. We talk about the mindset, yes. right? Yes. What, are, what do they need to be doing to retool at this time? I think the, one of the, the things that come to mind immediately for, for all of us is, is you have to build assets that solve problems. Right. And, and I think that's super important because the problems that that will exist that, you know, um, we we're on the phone, Dominique, last week with one of our clients, a major organization, and they weren't even in our business thinking about how to bring people back to work. 
Yes. That's a major problem that there are a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, hypotheses or, or scenarios that can play out in bringing people back. Some people are not going to want to go back or are nervous about going back. And so what's the risk associated with that? And our clients are dealing with the crisis right now. They're not thinking about the re redeployment of people coming into the workforce. And so I think you really got to pause and spend time with your entire team on reevaluating what assets can you develop to help people solve the new problem. And there will be 10,000 of them if we don't get so wrapped around the crisis. Mm -hmm. Coming back into mm -hmm. after this is over. So I think it's important if you're talking about retooling, build your recovery plan in the middle of the crisis. Get a team that's dealing with the crisis, but have a separate team in your company or some separate time if you're the company. Have some time that you are designating to talk about recovery in the middle of this. Because once the light switch is on, everybody's going to be running full speed trying to figure it out. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's why we where we are now. We didn't really plan properly for the pandemic to happen with all the data. So don't get caught in that position. The other things I would tell people is be really quick and clear and consistent in what you can do, when you can do it, and make sure you do it really, really well. I mean, if you're going to stay in business, you start talking about retooling. If if people didn't have great customer service, please put that on steroids. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to be the difference. People ask me, what makes you different than every organ organization? Is always on time, always great service. If you yeah. ask what separates you, always on time, always great service, non-negotiable. Because people are not going to give you two and three chances when they're trying to recover. So I would tell people to start retooling. Make sure that everybody on your team understands we will never be late and we will never um, perform below margin of what the expectations are. And so Excellent. be clear on what does the audience you seek need you to serve. And that's going to be different for all of us. I've, I've learned to, in this Dominique, pivot our entire company and our organization because the things that I learned with Zoom and, and, and social platform and relationships, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Relationship is your equity. It's the, it's the thing that will get you things sometimes when we, we can't get the loan or we can't. If you have a relationship with your bank, you'll be amazed at how much helpful, how, yes. how more helpful that could be for you. If you have a relationship with other organizations, how helpful that is. Don't take for granted the power of relationships. And so this is the time to collaborate. We're seeing it across our whole country. We won't so solve this pandemic by ourselves. It's going to take every right. country in the world to do this together. Small business owners, you're not exempt from that. It's going to take everybody to make this turn around the right way. So collaborate with everybody you can that's going in the right direction. So be quick, clear, and consistent in your messaging so people don't get confused about what you offer. And please don't try to be everything to everybody. So that that's good. So you said don't try to be everything to everybody, but look at your slide. It says, what does the audience you seek to serve need? All right. And so sometimes when you look at that question, right, yes. what you've been doing is not what you're going to need to do moving forward, exactly. right? So yes. we have a new normal. Um, and that new normal, what does it look like for business owners? And you need to understand how you show up in that, right? So yes. you as a consultant, as a coach, you're not going to meet with everybody face to face, right? You're you're yes. you're getting new platforms in order. I, it was so funny um, when you said we're going to have a 7:30 a.m. call on a on a Monday. I said for real, <laughs> you know, yes. but, you know <laughs> that cut through the clutter, right? Because as our day starts, we're all caught up in these Zoom calls, and yes. so on your call, you have 30 plus people, you know, ready to start their week. This is a new concept, right? And then we're we're good to go. There's no, you know, there's no conflict happening at that time. Yes. That was novel. All right. So for our business owners, you need to talk to your customers, understand what their changing needs are, understand how you can better serve them so that you'll be at the front of the class, right? Yes. Your finances are in order, Thomas. So because Thomas is going to give us, you know, the ways in which we can tap into these resources. Your finances are in order. You have a reserve in the bank and you are ready to serve, all right? I think the people who are going to have their doors closed and stay closed are the people who are not taking this time. We're giving this time for a reason. I, I gotta yes. put that in there. We're giving yes. this time for a reason. And those people who are not taking this time 
to figure out how to retool, to shift their minds. It's hard for all of us. Like I'm used to having a, a huge face-to-face -face conference and my supporter, my, my number one sponsor says, Dominic, you really need to think about leading the charge and making that large conference virtual. And I'm like, who oh, no, we can't, we can't, we have to be face-to-face, -face, right? But I'm having to step back and evaluate what would that really look like if we had to do that because there are tools available and there are options to make it virtual. I have to change my paradigm in order to survive, right? I have to change my paradigm with my customers. Um, I have two different types of customers. I have our corporate customers, our MBEs. What you all need as MBEs is different than what you needed a month and a half ago, right? Now you need consultative services with us. Now you need to learn how to partner together with each other. Um, what we needed financially is quite different than what it was yes. a month ago. So I love this slide, Ron. Thank you. Yeah, Thomas? Yeah, I think speed, yeah, I think on the yes, Dominique, speed, yeah, I think speed is everything. I mean, no yes. one's, I mean, and this is super important because, I mean, when people, urgency, what's important people talk about, Dominique, when it becomes urgent, people invest. Yes. And when they, when we get back into business, it's going to be a sense of urgency, but people are trying to figure out how to make money. People are trying to figure out how to just, they're right on the edge of, of not being around or, or being around. They are not going to wait for me to say, let me pull it together. If you're not using this time to pull everything together, so when it opens up, you're at the front of the door, in the front of the line and say, here's how we can help you. Here's what we have. Here's the, the solution to everything that you address. Speed will become everything. Nobody's going to wait for us when this opens back up. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Let's see if there's any questions. Valerie, are there any questions from the audience? Um, we want to focus on strength, how we become stronger as we close out. Valerie, do you have any questions? Uh, we have a couple of questions via the chat box. And the first one is directed to uh, Thomas. Uh, I saw in the news that Wells Fargo in particular was redirecting people away from the SBA loan. Can you expound on which financial institutions are actually still making small business loans? Yes, thank you for the question. I would I would just refer folks uh, because you know I can't refer specific banks, but we have a very comprehensive listing on the North Carolina side and um, uh, that will list lenders throughout the state. Uh, you you do have some lenders, even even your national lenders, that uh, for their own internal uh, issues may not be accepting applications, but there are numerous lenders, and I would also uh, not recommending specific lenders. But as Dominique mentioned, looking at your community-based banks, uh, smaller credit unions, and there are some credit unions that are SBA lenders, but in particular, the uh, community uh, bank uh, uh, space, uh, we've, we've heard of a lot of success on our smaller businesses uh, having results there. Okay, thank you. Um, another question's come in uh, for either Ron or Thomas. Uh, what options are available for sole proprietors with no employees or payroll? First on, well, in respect to SBA opportunities, sole proprietors are eligible for both the economic injury disaster loan and its accompanying grant and the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, for the economic injury uh, disaster loan, it's really a look at gross revenue, operating expense, and um, that's really what, the, what drives your, your eventual potential loan. For the Paycheck Protection Program, depending on how that sole proprietor realizes income, many, uh, and, and many folks haven't done the 2019 tax return because of the pushback of the date, you can do an estimate of, I believe it's your Schedule C, line 31, looking at your net, uh, your net profit, if that is how you realize income, because the PPP loan uh, takes an average uh, monthly payroll expense, uh, does a 2.5 times that, and that's that's the estimate for your potential loan. So uh, both uh, opportunities, both the Paycheck Protection uh, Loan and the IDLE are available for sole proprietors. But you can't you can't take both, can you, Thomas? I know you can take you can the 10,000 in the PPP, but can you take the other? You can take both. You just cannot use the proceeds for the same reason. So if you're utilizing the, and if, if you want to get the full advantage for the Paycheck Protection Loan, 
you would utilize that for payroll. At least 75% of those proceeds are 100. If you had an idle, you would, you may use that for other operating expenses, but not payroll expenses. So you can't you can't use the proceeds for the same use, but you can have you can have a secure both. So just to be clear, I can take the loan with the three percent or the two percent interest to pay my rent and operating expenses, and then I can take the PPP loan for payroll. Yes. Right. Just as long as you don't you duplicate. So that and candidly, that's that's a good strategy because the more you expend toward payroll above that seventy five percent, that will reduce uh, the, the that will reduce the amount that will be forgiven on the paycheck protection side. Okay, great. And if I already have a number for that ten thousand um, dollars, I, I should be expecting some communication soon. Like I when I signed up, I got two numbers. So that that's that's a good sign. That's a good yeah. That's a good sign, and uh, at least you you're in you're you're being considered. If you have not been denied, you're still being considered, and there's a potential ad existing uh, additional funding coming. Uh, and I'll provide and and so you can post uh, numbers that you can follow up, uh, and that's gotten much more efficient. A lot more resources dedicated to just to your customer service because of the volume. You can see if you know loan is in a uh, process or just that that type of basic information you can find out. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. What other questions, Valerie? Uh, we have one more. Uh, thank you for for those responses. Uh, this last question is directed to Ron. Uh, what recommendations do you have for changing our business model to better accommodate the need for a greater reliance on technology in the future? Yeah, and, and thanks for the question too, Valerie. Um, for small business owners, entrepreneurs, I think it's super important to pay attention to what the market is really telling you um, and, and be okay with being able to first willing to change your model. I think sometimes because we're so passionate about a certain thing um, as Blockbuster, which is no longer here, be cautious of, of what's working and what's not working and what clients are, are asking us to do. And so I think sometimes when you're in that space, have some people in your circle to say, hey, what is the market really asking for? You know, Zoom has been around for nine years and they had to hang in there that they're finally turning into something that's, that's working really, really well. And so I, th I think you'd be very transparent, be ready for reality, you know, once this is over and what's happening going forward is, is what your model should be built around because entrepreneurs are about identifying an issue and solving that issue. So look at everything that's in your business and say, what problem is it solving going forward? Um, there are some problems that, that other businesses, older businesses did not, they don't solve today. So look at education. If you look at anything in our educational world, there are a lot of problems that our higher learning institutions will encounter. How do you help them solve it? Because that's when you get the ear. And so I would say, look at your business model and ask the real question. I do this, so what? What does it mean to the people that you want to serve? And if you can't answer that so what question, put it back in front of your team. And until you can answer the so what, and it can't be because you're passionate, it makes you feel good getting up in the morning. That ought to be a part of it, but that will not help your bank account. It will not help you be able to pay your employees and keep food on the table. Ask the so what to the people that you're serving. And if that can't be answered, then you may want to look at your business model. Excellent, excellent. Okay, let's Thank close you. out. Any, any other questions come in, Valerie? That was it, that was the last one. Okay, gentlemen, let's close out with one, one parting remark from each of you. How can we be stronger, Thomas, coming through this? I, I think the thing that came out of this discussion is plan now, start planning now, uh, and be engaged. Uh, we are going to have a new normal, and businesses have to do a self-assessment to see how they're going to sustain and, and progress uh, in the coming months and years. So that process should be happening right now, and to um, be very assertive on those resources that are available. Okay, excellent. Ron, how can we be stronger? I would say a, a collaborate. collaborate, educate yourself, and understand what it is that you do specifically to help people. I mean, collaboration is super important. So collaborate and ask for help. Most of us okay. won't ask for help. Good. I like that. Thank you. VK, if you can go to the next slide. Another thing is to understand your value and understand why supporting minority businesses is important. I always like to end with this or start with it. Sometimes I start with it, but the economic impact of our work. We did a study and we looked at 
what is the actual value of doing business with minority business enterprises in our market? And we found that for every dollar that a corporation will invest with an MBE, we will return $1.72 back into the environment. And how does that happen? Every time a dollar is spent on a contract, a new contract, a new opportunity, MBEs create jobs. Those incomes through those jobs in advance the economy. And those, those people that they're employing are now able to spend that money. We're able to build schools. We're able to build homes. We're able to go out and we're able to be consumers. So there's a trickle down effect of supporting MBE. So there's an economic impact. It's not just a feel good. So it is so vital, so critical that our MBEs, those small businesses out there, usually those are under 50 employees, sometimes under 10 employees, those, uh, those employees who are struggling to survive, it's critical that they find the funding that's necessary to be able to keep their doors open so that this trickle down effect continues rolling over. So next slide, please, Valerie. So with that, I encourage each of you to reach out to our, our panelists here. Ron Harvey is, a, is available as a coach, a consultant. Thomas Stith is available um, to provide resources from an SBA perspective. We encourage each of you to tune in um, to our webinars. If you go to our website, cvmsdc.org, there's a list of webinars. Next week, we have a webinar with Premier, how to do business with Premier. We also have a webinar, how to do business with Duke Energy. You have to be at the table listening to these CPOs to understand how to work with them. We, and we bring this to you live each week. Our national organization has a weekly town hall meeting with CPOs from across the country, people from the SBA and other advocacy groups to give you the inside answers to be able to grow through COVID-19. Our goal is to help you be stronger in the end. So with that, I thank you, Thomas Stith, for joining us today from the SBA. Thank you, Ron Harvey, for joining us from GCS Consulting. And Valerie, thank you, our PR consultant, for uh, coordinating this for us. Um, this webinar will be hosted on our website uh, for future viewing. Feel free to share it with anyone who may have missed it um, because the information changes daily, folks, and we have to stay abreast of what's going on. So thank you all so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Valerie? That's it. So thank you all. Have a great day, everyone. Be well and stay safe. This concludes today's webinar session. All righty. Bye. Take care.